Toy Story 4 was another major success for Pixar and the Toy Story franchise with major love from critics and audiences, and now it's picking up all kinds of awards nominations. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with the director of Toy Story 4, Josh Cooley. So, Josh, what made you invested in wanting to continue this Toy Story saga past that initial trilogy? Uh, well, you know, I... Um... When I was told we were doing a Toy Story 4, I kind of had the same question that everybody did, which was, I thought we were, I thought we were done with it because of the, the trilogy. And, um, but the idea that seeing what was next for Woody was really interesting to me because we've seen this character, we all know this character so well, but what is next for him? What would be the next step in his life? And so, um, that and, that and just being a super fan of Toy Story and just, you know, I saw the first two before I even worked at Pixar. Uh, I think I was 15 when the first one came out. And so uh, I just always love the stories, always love the characters. And to, so to be able to continue uh, the story of Woody in that world was something that was um, couldn't turn down. Mm -hmm. And I imagine there was a lot of people surrounding you who had an idea in their mind of what this film should be, what this film shouldn't be. And mm -hmm. your process of sort of becoming the director wasn't necessarily something that happened right away from what I understand. So can you talk about um, just how much of what we saw in the final product was there when you first became involved and then how much the focus maybe changed? Yeah, the, um, the you know, early on, I think the from the very first version of the outline, Bo Peep was always part of the of that story and her return uh, was always part of it. In fact, we named the, you know, the code name internally was Peep from day one. So uh, I always loved the idea of seeing what happened to her. Um, the, uh, like you said, there's a lot of different voices because everybody is so invested in these characters in the world. And some of those voices were some of the original people that worked on the very first Toy Story. So I was lucky enough to work with, with a lot of them and um, have, you know, get their advice on how to shoot things from a toy's point of view or how, what they did in the previous films in order to really sell the idea of toys. And, uh, and also where we've been with the stories before and how they came up with those ideas. And then on the other hand, there was people on the crew that were, you know, uh, Toy Story was the first movie they ever saw when they were, you know, when they were five. So, and they were coming in from a, a super fan point of view. So it was really great to have this kind of very large spectrum of people that just have a lot of love for the um, franchise and in, in the world. Um, and just hearing, you know, getting that feedback from both sides. And we have Woody, who really goes through another very powerful emotional journey here. And Bo Peep also, like you said, gets a pretty major focus as well. And their relationship is very central to the film. And they're both really trying to find their purpose. So what was it about that approach to Woody's story and Bo Peep's story that really just compelled you to make it such a big focus here? Well, with Woody, it, it really was like, what is, uh, what is next for him? Uh, we've seen this character go through a ton in three films. Um, he was able to kind of let go of Andy, his kid, but it was like, what is next for him? Um, and just seeing that, you know, he, if he goes into Bonnie's room, it just can't be the same as Andy. Like, they're totally different kids. Um, Andy, you know, he was his favorite toy with Andy, but it can't be the same with Bonnie. It has to be different. Uh, to look at my own kids as examples of just, you know, they completely play with toys differently. And so um, just ha having him not be in that number one position, it's like, what would he be like? Somebody who's a natural leader like that, what would it be like to see him kind of um, be put in a situation where everything that he's learned and everything he's done before doesn't apply here? So uh, that was fascinating to me. And also just kind of treating him <clears throat> like we've done in every Toy Story film, Woody's always a parent. And so... Even though he's a toy, he always looks out for Andy. He's always saying, we've got to get back to our kid. Our kid needs us. And so to um, have him still have that philosophy, but in a completely different situation, I always thought was could be something really interesting. And then with Bo Peep not having her be in the third film, would kind of answer where was she for, kind of, for the super fans. But at the same time, her existence is to show Woody that there is a life outside the bedroom. And her point of view on that, I think, is something that he would only listen to because he knows her so well, or he thinks he knows her. So that since they had a past relationship, he can um, really trust what she has to say. Hmm. 
And of course, we also have Forky, who definitely became a breakout character that really just became one of the more unique Pixar creations. And so, <laughs> what was the thought process behind just creating this simple little spork that is also going through this existential crisis? <laughs> Well, I'll say that idea came out of, uh, we were sitting in the story room, just talking about the rules of Toy Story and the rules of the world. Um, you know, the first movie, it kind of establishes those rules. When you're not in a room, your toys are alive and they're, they're there for you. And we started talking about our own kids and, you know, my kids will pick up a rock and pretend it's a, a truck, you know, at, for a second and then put it down. And we were joking, like, well, what would that mean for that rock? Is that rock now alive because a kid has played with it, like in a Toy Story film? So we just started joking around about that. What would that be like? And thought, well, let's, let's just play with it and see what happens. And the idea of a spork came up, and it was just always funny. A spork is just a funny instrument. And so uh, we just kept going with it. And the thing that I loved about it early, or immediately was just having a character come to life, which we've never seen in any of the Toy Story films, that already felt new and fresh, which was something that's really important for a fourth film, is having uh, some freshness to it. Um, he'd come into life, but also not knowing any of the rules of the world. So the audience comes into the film going, I've seen one, two, and three, I know how this, how this world works. And we show them something completely new, and you have a character now who doesn't understand any of it. So there's so much comedy potential there. That was the first thing. And then when we realized we can actually use that character as um, a way for Woody to express what it means to be a toy, that's when he became so important to the story. And we realized, okay, he has to be in this movie. And then the third thing is once you get Tony Hale doing the voice, he brings so much to the character, so much uh, emotion, so much heart, and just so much comedy that it's just he's so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And another fascinating character in the film is Gabby Gabby, whose voice box is broken and she wants to take Woody's. And it really seems like she is set up as kind of a big villain of the film. But by the end, I think we have a real sympathy for her and she's a lot, she's more three dimensional than that. So can you talk us through just the process of playing with expectations with that character? Yeah, what you just, what you just walked us through is the, was the hardest thing. Was um, you know originally I think the first version of her we had was she was just just a villain primarily just a villain, and um, once we realized oh if, if we have Woody learn a lesson and then have it apply it to to the villain to Gabby and kind of bring her around um, that would be huge and but it's like how can we do that can we actually pull that off and so it was really um, it was interesting to go back through and kind of go through all of our scenes and go, how can we make her intimidating, um, which isn't very hard to do with a creepy doll, but how can we make her intimidating, but then, but then turn her so that we really do feel for her so that Woody can feel for her as well. And then we understand that what she's doing isn't, um, she's not just trying to be a malicious villain, but she actually has a, a story and a point of view that uh, none of our other characters have. So um, it was, and, and again, having Christina Hendricks do the voice, she was so great at being just kind of terrifying and then um, just, you know, heart melting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's a great voice performance. And speaking of voice performances, there's so many great actors in this film that yeah. lent their voices to this, whether it's Betty White, Carol Burnett, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner. We had Keanu Reeves as Duke Kaboom, which is a great role for him. Uh, you can Michael Key and Jordan Peele, also great comic relief. So can you talk us through just the process of kind of corralling all of those people? And also, did you were those the people that you had in mind for those specific characters? Yeah, absolutely. From, you know, the minute. I mean, the good thing about being uh, working on a Toy Story film is everybody knows Toy Story and mm -hmm. they want to be a part of that world. And so that's that's one of the blessings of it. And so. Just, uh, you know, we were able to approach everybody that we initially thought of and they and they said yes. And so, uh, well, yeah, when you actually look at the, the cast list, it's pretty crazy. And, and um, you know, just people that I've idolized my entire life from Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner, Carol Burnett, Betty White, everybody you were naming to, uh, you know, some of the greatest comic minds and, and actors of our time. So I've been really fortunate. And also with each 
Toy Story film, I feel like there's been a lot of big advances in animation and technology. So can you tell us some, some of the more significant moments in the film that were more challenging just from a visual design standpoint? Like I know the, the first scene that comes to mind is literally the first scene in the rain. That's just, you can tell right away that there's been some clear advances there. <laughs> yeah, a lot of love went into that, that scene for sure. Um, that, uh, I'm still kind of blown away by that, by the rain. It, when they showed me what they can do with the rain and there's all the, you know, just to get technical for a second, there's all the, the raindrops that hit and then there's the spray and there's secondary spray and then there's light bouncing all over the place. I don't even know how they do it, but um, it was gorgeous. And I just, I remember just telling them I wanted to feel like the toys at their level are just getting pelted. Like if this is the most violent rainstorm they've ever been from an adult level, human level, it's just kind of more, it's a downpour, but from the toys it's even worse. And so they were able to do that and even down at the toy level, I think they blew up the uh, raindrops like 500% or something like that to make it look even even harder. So um, a lot of love went into that. One of the other biggest things was the antique store itself. We knew early on we wanted to have an antique store, but we didn't know if we'd be able to make a, a big one or if we'd be able to render you know 10,000 items in that store, which is what's in the store. There, there are 10,000 different items that have all been set dressed in there. Um, there's so many different like glass cabinets and, and different styles of wood and metal and all these different types of materials that are, are holding all these things in there. And so you have to put that all through the computer and see if the computer will even uh, will still work after that. And um, they were able to make it make it happen. So that was a big thing, especially since a lot of the film is, takes place in that store. Yeah. Um, and this was your first outing as a director, at least for feature length films. So what was that experience like compared to your expectations, maybe going into it? Uh, cool. You always, I thought I knew what it meant to be a director and it was, it was like, okay, this is not, you have to do it in order to fully to understand it for sure. Um, but the great thing was that I had such an incredible crew that I could lean on and they, they're just so great at what they do um, that just being able to just trust that, you know, for the rain, for example, I'd say, can we do like a pelting rain? And they go, yes, let's, you know, we'll see you in a week and see what it looks like. And it'd be unbelievable. Same thing with the story, same thing with the, the lighting, every kind of department, they're all so good at what they do that um, they're able to do what you're asking and so much more. So it was great. I had a really great point of view making the film where I could just see all these amazing puzzle pieces that are being created and then they finally come together. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to spoil things too much for those who haven't seen it, but just considering how Toy Story 4 ends, do you still think that there is more story to be told with these characters in the form mm -hmm. of a Toy Story 5 or do you maybe see like this is sort of the end of this story? Well, I, I will say that, you know, um, with the fourth film, we definitely aim to, to complete Woody's arc as a character. So um, I'm very happy with, with Woody's, with, with what we did there. And, uh, but, you know, I will say that the end of every single Toy Story film has some sort of, um, you know, uh, nod to the future, even with a you know new puppy coming into the room, or with Jesse joining the room. But every film has, or you know, going to Bonnie's house. There's always the the implies that there's more. So uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea. That that's kind of out of my hands to make those decisions. But um, I'm happy with what we did. And if if there's more story to tell, there's more story to tell. Okay. Um, answer <laughs> that's pretty solid <laughs> yeah um so you're also an oscar nominee for best original screenplay for co-writing inside out back in 2015 and we really don't see animated films earning nominations like that outside of best animated feature very much and i was actually wondering if you had thoughts on just how there does tend to be a bit of a bias against animated films in those other fields and you know they also very rarely get into the best picture conversation and yeah. you know what yeah. you would what you would say to people who think of animation maybe as slightly less impressive than live action that whole bias uh yeah there's definitely a uh, definitely a bias that exists um I, I, let's see i don't even know how what i'd say it's like um 
you know, I wonder if part of it is that 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 people don't understand like how much what it actually entails to make a, an animated film and and what how everything that is in the film is directable and everything is created. I mean, these things look so impressive these days that I think it's people kind of maybe take it for granted, like oh, that's just the way it is, and and it's for and a lot of animation is for kids as well. So it's like, well, that's just for kids. So um, maybe it's not in the. I don't really have an answer for you. Maybe it's not in the uh, uh, in the air because of that. Just because animation just has been seen as a as a child's um, you know medium for so long. But the thing that I am excited about is there's so many more outlets now for animation, and there definitely are studios that are taking it in a more um, more adult angle. But I will say also that Pixar has always done that. We've never thought of it as being purely for, for kids. We're always trying to make movies for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, just to sort of wrap things up, I was wondering if you had any just fond memories from when you were nominated for Inside Out, whether it was nomination morning or going to the big event or anything sort of special like that. Um, the... the one of the most fun moments was uh, the Oscar luncheon. You know, they have a mm -hmm. luncheon where uh, all the nominees get together and, and have and have a meal and, and take a class photo and you get to meet everybody. And everybody's just really excited, so it's fun to just talk to everyone. And and I made a lot of friends that I still have to stay to this day that, uh, at that luncheon, and uh, that, that's that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you, Josh, for joining me today and. Congrats on the success of Toy Story 4. Thank and, you. and for the rest of you, please hit subscribe for more award season interviews and head over to goldderby.com to make some predictions of your own. Thanks Thank again. You.